Welcome this morning to Gate City United Methodist Church. And as our video said, we are having Holy Communion in remembrance of Christ, our Savior. That was a beautiful video. And a uh, few announcements this morning. I was told, and so I put it in bold print, do not touch the thermostat. <laughs> the heat has been adjusted and everything, so please uh, do not touch the thermostat. Uh, other announcements, as of course this week, we will on Thursday be remembering our veterans um, and the sacrifices that they have made. I know there are several veterans here in our congregation this morning. We appreciate your service and your sacrifice, and of course all of us are part of that sacrifice. If you're a wife or a mother or an aunt or a cousin or an uncle or brother or sister, grandchild of someone who served in the service, I, we all are, are covered under that. So actually, let's just say of a moment of silence, and let's remember those who sacrificed their lives for us. Amen. Other announcements? Let's see. The Young Adult Sunday School class begins today. Uh, that's uh, exciting, so uh, we look forward to that. And, of course, Daylight Savings Times ends, which all of you know because you're here on time. Um, Pastor Michael will be attending a preaching seminar in Dublin on the 8th and 9th. There will be a trustees meeting on the 9th. Uh, on the 14th, there will be a lay leadership meeting at 12. And on the 16th, at 6.30, a finance meeting followed by the admin council meeting. And, of course, on the 17th at 10 a.m., the ladies' prayer group and the snack sack will meet. Um, on 11.20, I see at 2 p.m., there's a celebration of life service for Jim Harless at the First Broad Street United Methodist Church. Any other announcements this morning? All right. When Dan's house burned down, his first phone call was to the guy who sold him his homeowner's policy. I need a check for the cash value of my house, and I need it as soon as possible, he said firmly. I'm afraid it doesn't work that way, explained the insurance agent politely. See, yours was a replacement policy which means that we'll be rebuilding the house exactly as it was before. I see, said Dan after a long pause. In that case, I want to cancel the policy on my wife. <laughs> Say hello to your neighbor this morning. Thank you to Miss Honora and Miss Kylie and Mr. Daniel uh, for bringing the light and the word of God into the sanctuary. 
And I know you're just seated, but now as you're able, will you please stand for the Apostles' Creed and let us say with joy what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn, page 577, God of Grace and God of Glory. Today is Psalm 127, and it's a, it's a little bit shorter of um, the lectionary psalms. So today, um, I'm just going to read um, all of these verses of Psalm 127 as we continue in worship today. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late... Toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring, a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. 
the great thing about Psalm 127 is it's really saying unless God is in the middle of it, it doesn't matter, okay? So, so it doesn't matter how, how hard you work unless God is in your work, your work doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how early you get up in the morning unless God is the focus point throughout your day, nothing else is going to matter. If God isn't the center point of your family and these blessings of family and children and grandchildren, unless God is not in the middle of it, none of that matters. And that's the focus of, of where we're going to be in our time of worship today, is that even in things we might consider mundane, God can still be right in the midst of it. Is there anything this morning, any praises or prayer requests that you want to lift up, just praying for God to be in the middle of a situation or thanking God that he has been? Courtney. Thank you, Sharon. Any others this morning? My brother is standing back in the hospital with us. Okay. I've never been. Any others this morning? Awesome, yeah. Yeah, thank you guys so much for that. Any others this morning? Okay. You know, Heather and I just want to extend a, a thank you on behalf of everyone. Pastor Appreciation Month is, um, it, is a lot of fun in October, and I just want to say we definitely felt um, the, the love and the appreciation uh, from, from everyone um, just for your uh, kind words and um, ways that you showed that appreciation to us. So we're very thankful and we're very glad to be uh, starting this journey, uh, continuing this journey, I guess, uh, with y'all in ministry. So any unspoken prayer requests this morning? All right, let's take these to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we need you in everything. Our God, we need you in all areas of our life. As, as the center, as, as the focal point of our lives, of our marriages, of our families, of this, your church, of our community and our nation, and of your world. God, we've lifted up prayers and concerns of our heart to you today. And for these names spoken aloud, we lift them up to you. For Courtney and the situation that she's facing. God, may you give her the strength and wisdom in this peace and comfort to be with her family and watch over her. May your shield of protection be around her and others. Thank you for what um, these young men and women have continued to do to provide for us and our freedom here. We lift up Ben and Gary and Diane Seaver to you in prayer this morning also. Lord God, all those names on our prayer list that we can pray over daily. God, we lift those up to you as well. God, I just thank you for opportunities that you continue to give us to be your church. 
opportunities to come together as this body of Christ, this body that we will celebrate and, and share at the communion table today. And so God, as we move forward in this time of worship, no matter what concerns and stresses that we may have brought in with us today, allow this to be a, a refuge, a sanctuary, a safe place to set these aside and just focus on you to make you the center of who we are and the center of our thought and our being. Let us truly engage together as the body in this time of worship. As you have heard our prayers, even those that perhaps we didn't speak aloud, but that we hold near and dear to our hearts. God, they are in your hands just as we are in your hands as well. And as, of you, as you have heard those prayers, hear us now as we come together in a prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Of glory in our God of grace.
that all good gifts come from you. Thank you this morning for allowing us the opportunity to give out of the abundance that we have been given to put some together with others to create much. God, may your hand and your, um, your whole being be over these gifts of our tithes and our offerings this morning. And as they are given, God, help us do good with this. Help us use this to further your kingdom because this is all your world. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. If our children want to come forward for children's time this morning. Morning. Oh, my goodness. You're so loud. I feel like we have more kids in this. I saw some other ones up there. Do we have some kids up there? Oh, here they come. I still felt like there was more. Okay. Well, good morning, guys. How are y'all doing? Huh? <gasps> Hi. You're so excited to be here. We all should be this excited to be at church. Yes. All right. So Pastor Michael's going to read a little bit of scripture, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it. Okay, so this morning I'm going to read some verses from the book of Luke. So do you think Luke is in the Old Testament or in the New Testament? The New Testament. The New Testament. Very good. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke. All right, so Luke 16, this is Jesus talking, and Jesus says, Whoever can be trusted with just a little can also be trusted with very much. But whoever is dishonest with a little will also be dishonest with much. If you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, how will we trust you with true riches? And the Pharisees heard this and they sneered at Jesus. And Jesus said, um, what people value highly is detestable in God's sight. You cannot serve both God and money. Now to that. <laughs> wow. That sounds like it's kind of talking about like money, like coins and dollars and all that stuff. And I think that it is. But it also can be talking about other things that we have in our life and how we care for them. So since you all are kids, and I don't think any of you all have jobs yet. If I'm wrong, tell me. Does anybody have a job yet? She's 13 and she has a job? Well, good. She's starting young. Yeah. Yeah. So, but do you guys have things that you really, really like? Do you have that one special toy that you like better than any of your other toys? Do y'all have like one that you really like? Yeah. So when I was little, you don't have one toy that you like better than the other? You like them all. Okay, well, we're going to talk about all because most of us, when, uh, well, when I was a kid, I had, I had a lot of toys, but I had one that was my favorite, and it was this teddy bear, and I love this teddy bear, and this teddy bear had a special home on my bed. This is where I kept my teddy bear, so I know where it was at at all times, and there was one time that someone gave me a candle as a gift, and my mama said that I could light my candle and burn it so I could watch it. Well, something bad happened, and there was a little fire, and I freaked out, and this bear saved my life because I put the fire out with my teddy bear. And my teddy bear, after, from then on out, had a scar, had a burn scar on it, and I felt so bad because this was my favorite teddy bear, and I'd always taken care of this teddy bear. But you know what? Even though something bad happened, I still kept taking care of that teddy bear, and I would put it on my bed, and I knew right where it was at. And up until not too long ago, I still had that teddy bear. And finally, I decided it was time to let go. But I always took care of it, and it was very special to me. Yes. So even though you're little and you don't have, like, money that you can kind of take care of and do good things with, you do have some possessions and toys and God wants us to take care of all the things that he has given us. Yes. So remember that when your mommy and daddy ask you to um, pick up your toys maybe. Because if you can take care of the, the toys that you have, then you can also take care of new stuff. Because I know everybody's Christmas coming up. You might want some new toys. 
Um, but I'm also going to talk to the people in this church for just a minute. Because look at this beautiful church we have. We've been given much, haven't we? We've been given much. Um, and I just want to encourage all of us to do our part to take care of this beautiful church and fill it up. Let's fill it up, people. Let's ask people to come and bring their children and their grandchildren. Now, don't go to somebody else's church and try to take their members. That's not what I'm saying. But we all know somebody um, who's not regular somewhere. So I want to say we've been given much, uh, and let's take care of it. Yes. All right. Let's pray. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for all the things that you have given us. Help us take good care of everything, our toys, our families, our homes, our churches, even this world. Help us take care of your creation and be good stewards in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Kyla, you want to hand those out to everybody? Awesome. <clears throat> one little note while they're getting situated, um, one of the things that we've been given and we can take care of, obviously, and, and one of the, the kids was actually talking to me about this a couple weeks ago, is this great playground out here. And somebody had looked at it and they're like, well, why can't we go play on it? Because it's ready. And it's almost ready, but not quite. So just as an update, there is some edging that we've still got to put down, um, fabric, uh, something that needs to go down. I can't think of the word of it. Um, and then after that, there's going to be mulch coming that we bought. Not sure when it's going to be here yet, uh, but it is going to be coming. And once all that gets here, then we will be ready. You know, one of my favorite parts, and I've mentioned this before, of a worship service um, is <clears throat> when we get to welcome new members uh, into the church. Uh, sometimes that comes by profession of faith, and sometimes that comes from a transfer of membership. And today we want to do that. And it's exciting to me because last month we got to welcome three new members in, um, Chris and Christopher and Cameron Henderson. Today we're going to welcome two new members into membership, Joe and Vicki. So I'm going to ask you guys if you all want to come up with me this morning. Um, Very good. Uh, we talked about this. Reception into a local church is, is very similar to, to marriage. Uh, in fact, if you go through our membership recognition liturgy in our hymnal, um, and you go through the marriage um, ceremony in our hymnal, and even the baptismal ceremony in our hymnal, a lot of the wording is the same, and it's, it's the same because it's about a covenant. Now, when we join together as the body of Christ, as members of the church, there's things that we covenant that we will do and, and that we will encourage one another. And as Heather said, that we'll, we'll be here. Uh, whenever we come together and there's people not here, we're just missing parts of the body. And that's just the reality of, of, of worship together. So, so these aspects are so important. And I want to thank you guys. For, for taking the step this morning to do that. Um, membership is a, is a commitment, and it's something that you're pledging your faith and your trust in these other people, uh, and they are pledging their faith and their trust in you, and we realize that we are all needed together to be this body of Christ. And when the body grows via membership a little bit, it's just an exciting thing for me. I've got some questions from our reception into the United Methodist Church I would ask you. And you can answer these um, questions by simply saying, I will. Joe and Vicki, as members of Christ's Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and your care. Will you do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love? May the God of grace, who has called us all into eternal glory, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and in peace. Let us pray together. 
Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this opportunity. We give you thanks to stand shoulder to shoulder with others who place their commitment and their faith and their trust in you alone and who strive to live this out in connection with others in community and in love. So God, as Joe and Vicki have taken this step to join Gate City United Methodist Church as members, I just ask may your blessing continue to be poured out on them as new and exciting things are happening in this church, in this body of Christ, God. We give you honor and we give you glory. And may you continue to lead, guide, and direct us to be the church that you have called us to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. All right. Congratulations. It is official. Congratulations. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you guys for that one. Um, there's a fine line between preaching and meddling. Have y'all ever heard that one that before? I, I think it, it possibly has to do with the context of what is being preached. Or at least maybe it has to do with the way that we take it. I, I read a <clears throat> survey. Uh, there are some three things in particular that American evangelical Christians 
don't like it when their preacher preaches about. To give you a heads up, I'm going to be preaching about one of these three today. But I think it's important to say evangelical American Christians uh, because that's a unique group. Sometimes how we perceive things is culturally based. In the 1980s, ZZ Top released a song called Pearl Necklace, and everybody loved it. In Atlanta, Jock Peterson wears one, and everybody's like, what? But then in most Scandinavian countries, the more jewelry that a man wears is a sign of prominence, authority, and power. So maybe, maybe there are some cultural implications to how we actually view things. Maybe there's cultural reasons for these actually as well. The number three thing that in this survey people said they don't like it when their preacher preaches about is hell. Now, I kind of understand that one a little bit coming from the background I did because I heard about hell every single sermon. It's where you were going, or it's where I was going, to hell. And not just to hell, I was going in a very specific mode, according to most people in that church. It was in a handbasket. Now, I heard Shonda Pierce say she didn't know how big that handbasket had to be to get everybody there, but apparently growing up in, in that faith tradition, it must have been a pretty big handbasket. But hell is an important topic. It's something we should be able to talk about and address, right? It's a, it's a physical and spiritual reality, but hell is really about separation from God. That is the horrible thing about hell. Hell's not something that we want to preach to be able to scare it out of you to somehow scare you into heaven because that's not what a relationship with Jesus is all about. In fact, in 1 John, we're told that there is no fear in love and that God is love and that perfect love casts out all fear. So we don't turn to God because we're scared. We're not trying to get into heaven as a, as a get out of hell free card, right? Hell is the reality for those who willfully choose separation from God. Now, we don't have to worry about that as much here this morning, probably. The number two thing people say they don't want to hear their preacher talk about is politics. Now, I want to say I agree with this one. I don't think anything Republican, Democrat, Independent, or whatever should ever come from here in the pulpit. It just shouldn't. Now, are there areas that we need to discuss that have been politicized by our culture and by our nation? Probably, yes. But it's never going to be a time where, where it's, it's vote this way. It's never going to be, you'll never hear, if you don't vote this way, you're not a Christian. Because I don't believe in that. I believe in unity in the body of Christ, but also diversity in the body of Christ. I believe if we can't have Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and people who just don't know as part of the church, then we're missing a future reality of what heaven is going to be like because there will be all of those people in heaven. There will be all the different denominations in heaven because all that matters for that eternal inheritance is placing our faith and our trust and our salvation in the name of Jesus. Are you all with me on that one? Okay. The number one thing, does anybody want to take a guess on what the number one thing that you don't want to hear your preacher talk about from the pulpit is? Ta-da! Money! Guess what we're going to talk about today? Money in a roundabout sort of way. Here's the deal. There's 38 parables of Jesus in the Gospels. Now, some of the parables are told in more than one gospel. Some are unique to only that one. There's 38 different parables of Jesus. Out of those 38, 16 of them have to do with wealth, money, or possessions. So about half of the parables that Jesus told. Now, there's about 500 verses in the Bible on prayer. We would probably say prayer is a pretty important topic, right? Anybody think prayer is pretty important in your daily life? About 500 verses on prayer. There's almost 2,000 verses in the Bible on wealth and possessions. And I just want to say, I think if it's that big of a deal to God, then we should have it in the right context. It's not something that I'm, I'm scared to talk about. 
I'm with a, in a pastor's group, and, and it's funny because the number one thing pastors want to try to avoid preaching about is money. It's, and I just realized it shows 323 three instead of 321. But that's okay. There's, there's something really cool in there in, like a, in a rhythmic beat, but I don't know what it is, so I can't do it. But anyway, um, it's, it's supposed to be number one. Um, but it shouldn't be number one because it's just, it's just a thing. Right? It's just a resource. Now, today, I'm not only going to be preaching partially about this one topic that we hate to hear, I'm also going to be basically preaching somebody else's sermon. Before we have too many concerns with plagiarism <laughs> or moral or ethical concerns, let me tell you, the sermon was preached in the 1750s by John Wesley. It was preached as a way to allow Methodists an understanding that he felt like they needed of money. But what I think, I think it's as pertinent today as it was then. And here's the thing I want to, I guess, throw out right now. I think part of the concern we have when hearing about money from the pulpit is you hear one of two things. Number one, you hear, well, you need to give more of it. Or number two, you hear the church needs more of it. So you need to give more of it. And I want to say, I'm not going to talk about either one of those things today. Uh, a sermon on money shouldn't be about how the church needs more of it. All right? God, God can pay his celestial mortgage if you don't tithe your 10%. That's not what this is about. What this is about, though, is a better understanding of the perspective of money in our lives. Here's the big idea. I believe that that our, our checkbooks are a moral and ethical reflection of what we value most. Okay? I want to say today what I think is important is where we spend our money and what we spend our money on is an indication of what we most value. In fact, that's how Wesley approached this sermon in the 1700s. Before I get into sharing some things from that, I want to jump back into this passage of Scripture. It's Luke chapter 16, verses 10 through 13, to hear this again. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? If you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. The use of money was the title of Wesley's sermon. I want to put on the screen what he had to say about money because I think it's just a beautiful um, statement of, of identifying this. Wesley said this, uh, money is an excellent gift of God, answering the noblest of ends. In the hands of his children, it is food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, clothing for the naked. It gives to the traveler and the stranger where to lay his head. By it, we supply the place of a husband to the widow, of a father for the fatherless. We may be a defense for the oppressed, a means of health to the sick, of ease to them that are in pain. It may be eyes to the blind, feet to the lame, and a lifter up from the gates of death. Now that's a pretty interesting concept, I think, of money. Wesley saw all the good that could come from money. And all the good that can come from it had to do with other people. Do you see that? All of the, the purpose of the money is how we help people who do not have what we have, help people who need what we have, and to literally be the, I guess as Paul would have said, the hands and the feet of Christ Jesus, right? See, these verses from Luke are part of a longer parable in Luke chapter 16. It's called the parable of the shrewd manager. But these particular verses that I read to you, I think really have to do with stewardship. Now, stewardship is a word that has lost a lot of its importance over the years. Sometimes now we view stewardship as, as simply as something we do in church to try to raise money to buy that one thing we need, right? Or we have a stewardship Sunday or a stewardship campaign to raise particular funds when, when stewardship is really so much more than that. Genesis chapter 2, 
When God created man and he put him in the Garden of Eden, verse 2.15 says to work it and to take care of it. Now that's what stewardship's about. Working it and taking care of it. And we do that with the resources we've been given. Now some people's been given a lot of resources. Some people maybe haven't been given as many resources, which is the beauty of why we come together as the church, right? We place our resources together and we're able to be good stewards of what it is that God has called us to be. So with all of that good stuff that can come from money, why is it that we have problems talking about it in church? Why would it be that we have negative connotations about money? So to help with that, I want to ask you two questions. The first question is this, what is the purpose of money? It's not rhetorical. I mean, it's, we're like, if you're online with us, feel free to type in that chat, what is the purpose of money? If you're in, purpose, in person with us, feel free to vocally type in that chat. What, is, what do you think the purpose of money is? To pay bills, okay? As a means of exchange. Somebody was like, wow, that's a good one. I'm not going to say what I was going to say now, so. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go with those two then. <laughs> to buy clothes. Thank you for that honesty right there. That's what we're looking for, <laughs> right? Okay. Let me ask this question then before we get into the next one. Is money good or is money bad? Okay, so everybody's got an answer on that one. I like that one, right? Yeah, yeah, right? Okay, so, so here's the thing. Um, money only has the power that we assign to it, okay? And I think that's really where we get into the issue is in that word power. When John Wesley preached his sermon, he laid out three simple rules for Methodists. Now, you may think of three simple rules, and you may think of our general standards in our book of discipline. The, the Methodist Church was founded on three simple rules of who we are as Methodist Christians. Do no harm, okay? Um, do good and stay in love with God. Or Wesley said it, attend to the ordinances of God. Uh, he liked to keep things in threes. So he did the same thing with money. What he saw in the 1700s is that as Christianity, as Methodism was growing in the country, as the industrial age was beginning, he looked at people who are Methodist Christians. And he thought, man, if anybody wanted to hire an employee, it would be a Methodist Christian, right? If anybody was going to be a business owner, it would be a Methodist Christian. And his reason for thinking this was because Methodists, as Christians, are going to be the most honest employee you could ever have, right? They're not going to lie. They're not going to stir up controversy in the workplace. They're never going to have an issue um, and grumbling about people that they work with, right? Because they're not going to bear false witness against thy neighbor, right? They're not going to steal from you, right? They're not going to wish they had more or were paid more, more than they were paid because that's covetous. So they're not going to do that. So in Wesley's mind, Methodist Christians are the ideal employee. Now, while that's a wonderful thing, he also saw that as a potential problem. Because as an ideal employee, you're going to have more opportunities to money. You're going to get hired. You're going to get raises in his line of thinking. And as that happened, that money could create a problem in your life unless we handle it the right way. So the first thing Wesley said to do is earn all you can. Now, I don't think most people here have a problem with this one. This is like capitalism as its finest right here. Before it was ever capitalism, Wesley was the one who was like, work really hard and make all the money you can. And that's how I understood money when I began working. It was a means of an exchange. I wanted a car. I've shared that with you. You've seen the pic Well, you didn't see the picture of the vet. You saw the picture of the Mustang. But I wanted that Chevette. And the only way I could get that Chevrolet Chevette was to get a job. So I had to... I had to get a job so I could get a paycheck to where I could afford the car. So I needed to earn all that I could to be able to afford what it was that I wanted. And money was just a means of an exchange. Now, I learned as I did that, that the, the harder I worked, the more money I made. Also, the more jobs I got to do of other people, but that's, a, that's another sermon probably there. But I also learned that the, the, the more hours I worked, right, 
the more money I made. And it was all about in this earning all you can. Wesley, in his, in his foresight, saw a problem with that. Because sometimes in our earning all we can, we can just get so focused on the job that we can lose track of other things. So John Wesley said this, In all your earning we must not gain all that we can at the expense of life or family or marriage or health. It's do no harm. So Wesley was saying, look, as as Christians, earn all you can, work hard, but don't do it at the expense of your, your, your marriage. Don't be gone all the time. Don't do it at the expense of your, your family. Don't do it at the expense of your own health. I wish I had lived out these verses a little bit better when I was in my 20s and 30s. And Wesley saw that while we need to earn it, we also need to do no harm. And he also said this, which is interesting, that in all our gaining it should be fair trade. Make no gains where other people are hurt or marginalized because of your gaining. I think Paul said it this way in Colossians, work as if you're working for the Lord, not for man. Okay? So the first thing about money, to understand it, I think, in the correct way, is make it. Be productive. Right? If you can work, work. <laughs> if you're physically able, get up and do it. Right? There are plenty of jobs that are hiring right now. There are people in this room who would hire people right now, right? So if you're online watching with us and you need a job, just type it in. We will connect you with somebody. Wesley said, earn all you can. And then he said, after you earn it, you save it. Now, this one we probably don't have a problem with either. My grandfather literally had the coffee can under his bed full of money because he didn't trust the bank for whatever reason. When I worked for Pizza Hut, we had a 401k, and now I have a pension plan as a, as a pastor. We pay into it every month. Every full-time United Methodist Church pays into this pension plan, so you're actually helping support clergy, perhaps, that you will never meet on this side of eternity, but you're helping them in their ministry and with their families now. Saving, we probably understand as something important, but Wesley's not talking about saving as in a 401k. He's not talking about savings as in terms of a a pension plan. He's talking about not spending your money on anything that is non-essential. Now, I want to be honest and say this is a tough one. This is a tough one for me. Perhaps this will be one of the toughest of the three for you. Here is how John Wesley worded this. Do not waste any part of so precious a gift in gratifying the desire of the eye by superfluous, expensive apparel or clothing, by needless ornaments, waste no part of it in adorning your house or in superfluous or expensive furniture or in costly pictures or painting or gilding or books. Or books, I can't believe he said books or in elegant rather than useful gardens. Gardens were important to Wesley, but not just for the look. They were important for what came out of them. I think we have to understand John Wesley a little bit before we can get into this one. And I'm not going to try to trivialize or minimalize what he said. I mean, he said what he said, and I think he believed every aspect of it. Wesley, when he left Oxford, he got his first job as a pastor of a church. And he got his first paycheck, and he had went to town with some of his uh, colleagues and friends, and he, he was renting a little flat in London. And when he was in town, he saw a painting. And he said the painting just captured him. It stirred something within his soul. He had a beautiful gift of words, and he went on about what this painting did. And, and for any of you that love art, maybe you've seen a piece of artwork that has really done that to you. And he said he's just stood captivated by this painting for hours, mesmerized by all the intricate lines and details. And so he bought it. It was about half of his paycheck. The wonderful thing about earning all you can is you know you're going to get another one, right? So he spent about half of his paycheck. And he took it home and he hung it up. And the next morning when he got up, he said that he had had dreams all night, that the painting wasn't this beautiful painting that he saw, that God had put the faces 
of hungry people in his painting. That God had put the images of the orphan children in his painting. That God had put a, the, the picture of, of the homeless lame man who was on the side of the road in between where Wesley bought the painting and where Wesley lived. That man who could have used that money was in the painting. So for Wesley, he felt like God was really working on him specifically about what it was that he spent his money on. And I think that changed how he lived his life. Now I want to say, I'm okay with getting pay raises. I'm going to be honest and say that as your pastor. I don't know if that, that's concerning or not, but I'm okay with that. I will say every pay raise I think I'd ever received in my life, I looked at the pay raise as now I have more money for what I need or want. No, no is right. <laughs> anybody else ever thought that way? That if, anybody ever thought, if I just had a little more money, right? If I just had more money, I could do this. If I had more money, I could pay this. If I had more money, I would help that person. But I don't, right? If I just had more, and I want to say, that's not it. The problem is never going to be solved by more money. The problem is, is solved by how we have a proper understanding of money and how we use it. So here's how Wesley handled that. I want to give you a summary. If you love numbers, um, anybody love numbers? If you love numbers, okay, for the three of us, great. For everybody else, just work with me a little bit on this one. This is really for me and Joe and Joe on this one. All right, um, Wesley wasn't paid in dollars. He was paid in pounds, all right? Um, and a pound today in today's market is about $1.36 if you're into that kind of thing. But here's what I want to show you. The first year Wesley worked, he made 30 pounds. It took him about 28 pounds to live on, so his other two pounds he gave away. Okay? It's about 7% of his income. The next year, now Wesley was a pretty good preacher, okay? He just was. The next year, his income doubled. He made 60 pounds. He lived on 28 pounds. He gave away 32, which is about 53% of his income. The third year, Methodism is growing. John Wesley is rocking. Charles is writing hymns. He made 90 pounds. He lived on... 28 pounds. He gave away 62 or about 69% of his income. The fourth year, John Wesley is a sought after preacher overall. He made 120 pounds. He lived on 28 pounds. He gave away 92, which is about 77% of his income. And then the last year before Wesley died, he made over 1,400 pounds. In his journal, he wrote a three page lament that he spent more that year than he had ever spent. It took him about 30 pounds for his daily living, which means he gave away 98% of his income. Now, I say that because when we get to the third part, after earn all you can, save all you can, Wesley said, give all you can. I don't give away 98% of my income, <laughs> but I could give more than I do. In 2018, there was a national survey that showed 2% um, of Americans give to charitable organizations. 2%. The same study showed 2.3% of American Methodists give. That survey showed that 15 out of 25 Methodists don't give anything financially because they feel like they don't have enough to give. And I want to say the problem is not that we don't have enough. The problem is where we place our importance. The problem is, as Jesus said, where we place our love. Now, here's how Paul said it to Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, 8 through 10 says this. But if we have food or clothing, can y'all just say an amen if you have food and clothing this morning? Amen. We will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I wonder how stressed, how much of our stress level at times in our life has been over money. I wonder how often we have pierced ourselves with many griefs over money. 
when in fact what Paul said is if we have food and clothing, be content. We have what it is that we need, right? God will provide for us. Sometimes God uses other people to provide for us as well. I want to say as a United Methodist pastor, Heather and I are deeply aware of how God uses people to help provide for us. We're aware of that, and we're thankful for that. And as we are here, I believe that God is, is calling us as his church to just trust him. These two weeks, I want to talk, wanted to talk to you about two words, and they're what if. What if God has something in store for us in our lives or in the life of the church that we could never have imagined on our own? I want to end today just with some final numbers. Um, our administrative board approved a 2022 budget from our finance committee for this church of $199,000. That's a lot of money, man. Our Appalachian district budget is over $179,000. That's a lot of money. Our Holston Conference budget, which I'm the secretary for our Holston Conference Finance Committee, so I see this a lot. Our Holston Conference budget is $8.7 million. Now, that's a lot of money. And here's how I view the money. Behind every dollar, there is a life that could be changed for Jesus. It's that simple. Behind every dollar is a ministry that could show the love of Jesus. Maybe it's in a playground. Maybe it's in better live streaming. Maybe it's in, in packing food for children. Maybe it's in a Christmas cart. But behind every dollar, we can be making a difference in the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. What if? Well, what if is kind of the, the principle, I believe, of communion. It is God doing something new and something different. What if, the idea behind that is, what if God has something in store for us and we never even imagined it? Like, I never even saw this coming. <laughs> That's this table, man. I mean, everybody thought that a relationship with God was this way, right? Everybody thought you had to do these things to be in a relationship with God. And then Jesus shows up and he turns everything upside down. And he says, what if? What if we can imagine a relationship with our Lord differently? Which is why Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and who seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, take a moment and let us in silent confession lift up our prayers to God. As forgiven and reconciled people, I can say, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night in which our Lord gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks, he blessed the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks, he blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts of our Lord Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine 
Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquets. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Today we will share via intinction the one loaf we are reminded as it is broken. It is Christ Jesus who in our brokenness will make us whole. We share in one cup today as a reminder of the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins so that through this forgiveness each of us may come into relationship with our Lord and Savior.
us pray. Gracious and loving God, as you have fed us from your table, help us now be people who can help feed others. God, as you have filled us from your table, help us be ones who can fill others. These things we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. have been filled with the grace and the love of God, we have an opportunity to show, to go and share that grace and love with others. As the lights are extinguished from this table, know that that light of Christ now shines brightly and deeply within you. As you go from this place, may we go in the love, grace, and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen, and be blessed.